Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be making a short video where I'm going to be talking directly about why I set my palettes up the way that I do. I have a lot of palettes. This one I use in my studio. These I carry around and, and work with on outside. This one I can carry around and work with outside, but I also take this to work in watercolor classes. So why do I set my palette up the way that I do was a question that was asked by someone. I've made a couple of videos where I show you how to set up a brand new or prepare or prep a brand new palette, whether it's plastic or metal. And then I also made a, a video where I talk about how to squeeze the colors into the palette wells and the reason that I scratch inside the wells where the paint goes, but not with the palette where I mix my colors. However, those are two other videos. This video, I'm gonna quickly run through why I set my palettes up the way that I do. Let's just take a quick look at this one that I have in my studio. This is just a color swatch that I made that shows the colors by name and by brand and how they're fixed. Please excuse the wells that are dirty. I use this palette in my studio. I'm making no excuses for it because I reactivate these colors. So I'm not trying to clean them every time I finish working. But the colors and the way that they're set up is primarily the conversation. Minus these three for this palette, which are kind of sample colors. I'm mainly gonna talk about these three yellows, these three reds, and these three blues. And then I'm going to switch and show you a couple of different palettes. I like to have my colors directly across from one another that actually match up with each other to produce the color vibrancies or color mixtures that I normally prefer. Where the colors can't go across from one another, then I revert to the system that I call a one, two, three, four system. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So the corresponding numbers and where they're positioned then tells me that the three of the yellow and the three of the blue will work well together. The, the two of the red and the two of the yellow will work well together. So will the one, so will the two, so will the three, and so on. These are neutral tints, so I don't really need to number those. I know that these two are different brands of neutral tint, and this is a Payne's Gray. I'm gonna quickly show you a couple of others before I get into the detailed explanation. So these are palettes that I use when I'm working outside. All right, these are palettes that I carry in my backpack. Sometimes I carry these to watercolor classes so I can share with students who don't have any colors when they do come. One of them is made up right across from one another with the still the same one, two, three method. This one is in a row numbered accordingly. One, two, three, one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and then these are, or this is a fourth, and this is a neutral tint color. So even when I have my palettes running straight across, I still know which ones match corresponding to each other based on the number that they are. I keep my colors kept by groups of either yellow, blue, or red. That's it. And then I set them off into locations of one, two, three, and or four. And to make this really, really clear and clean, I'm gonna to switch to one more palette. And this will be the one I basically talk the rest of this class through. I carry this to class. I also take this to a watercolor class. Normally, I don't have any greens, but for the purposes of the class, I do have greens in this one, but I'm gonna omit that in the conversation because it's not part of my natural flow. I'm gonna stick with the color palette and why I have it arranged the way that I do. So again, looking at this palette, you can see that there are some colors that run directly across from one another and others that are just in the one, two, three, slash four type category. So I know that this one red goes great with this one yellow or this one red goes with this great one blue. So what it makes easier for me is I already know what the names are, but what I wanna know is which ones mix well together. Why is that important? And this is where the conversation gets a little detailed and hopefully it won't be confusing. When it comes to colors, there are a lot of things a lot of people could care less about, maybe they don't even know about, or perhaps they know about them, but again, doesn't really matter to them. But it kind of matters to me only because I'm not what you might call a purist and nor am I a 
um, a professional watercolorist who makes a lot of money making and selling watercolors. I'm just a guy that likes to be creative. I like to have fun. And when I'm going to have fun, I just want to make things as easy for me and as quick for me as possible to make these combinations. Because as we know, color mixing by itself is a lifelong process. Well, I'm not looking to do that. I'm just looking to make sure I can match up my colors and keep it moving. But what I have learned in my limited amount of time is that some colors are cool, some colors are warm. Some colors have blue tint in it. Some colors have red tint in it. Heck, some colors even have pink and orange and all of that. But I'm not going to go there. What I'm trying to explain is if you just look at a basic color wheel and you look at some of the colors that are similar but they're off a little bit, that's what I'm talking about. How do I mix a color that's clean versus how do I mix a color that's a little bit on the muted and or if I, for lack of a better word, they're kind of a dirty side. So that's why I keep my colors separated and pretty much combined to know which ones are going to go well together. Any red and any yellow will make an orange. But what kind of orange? See, that's the key. Is it a shadow orange? Is it a grayish orange? Is it a dirty orange? Or is it a clean orange? Is it a bright orange? And that's why I make my palette the way that I do, so that I can know which of those combinations are going to give me the best results. And I know that by what I've studied, what I've taken notes on, and what I've even made color swatches to experiment with. For example, alizarin crimson is a cool color, and it's kind of on the blue, has a kind of a blue undertone inside of it. This lemon yellow is also a cool color and it also has a tint of blue in it. Now, even though you don't distinctly see those, that's my point. So when I mix these two together, the two blues cancel each other out. The reason that that's important, if I was to go with the cadmium yellow, which is a warm yellow, it's in the reddish tint, you see? So now if I mix certain colors together, am I just mixing two colors or am I actually mixing three? And we all know by the opposites on the color wheel that red and blue, I mean, I'm sorry, red and, and um, was I saying that right? Yeah. Red and green complement each other. So since red and green complement each other, they also make great shadows for your red apples, for example. So if I'm trying to mix something together, do I want that to clash or do I want to keep the color clean? Therefore, I need to know what my warm colors are, what my cool colors are, which colors have what kind of tint in them, which colors are great for neutralizing, which colors are great for making darks. So let's talk about this, for example. Here's a color chart that I made of alizarin crimson and lemon yellow. And this is a basic orange that I get. Why did I use the word basic? Because in color mixing, it depends on how much of each color you're mixing. Even though you're mixing red and yellow, if you put more red to the mixture, you're going to get a slightly different orange. If you put more yellow to the mixture, you're going to get a slightly different orange. So I tried to mix these colors just basically using the color straight down, the color straight down, stir them together just a little bit and let them activate and see what comes out. So now let's take a quick look at cadmium red and cadmium yellow. And as you can clearly see using the same process, I get a slightly different orange. Now again, to some people makes no difference. But to me, I just like to know these things because it makes my job easier when I'm trying to create an orange or an apple or a grape. And I want to have those color variables inside of that color spectrum on that one piece of fruit. And the same could be true as if you look at the burnt sienna and the yellow ochre, which are both earth tones. So what happens here, they cancel each other out and they cancel each other out based on the amount of burnt sienna to the amount of yellow ochre. So this could have easily been more on the burnt sienna side had I just added a little bit more burnt sienna or in this case, more to the yellow ochre side, since yellow ochre was the last color to go in. And when I stirred it, that's what I got. So let's continue. So now let's take a look at 
cerulean blue and lemon yellow and ultramarine blue and cad yellow. So I clearly get two different shades of green. And there's even another color that I often don't either have or don't use, but it's a great color, which is phthalo blue, which would also make a different color yellow when mixed with these two combinations. So let's just talk about the cerulean and the lemon. I get a nice, light, clean, kind of a yellowish green. Then when I mix the ultramarine blue and the cad yellow, I get a kind of a dark green. And again, all of these color swatches that I'm showing you could easily be in the hundreds where I'm just adding different amounts of each color to get a different shade of green. But for the purposes of these swatches, I just try to bring in a natural blue, a natural yellow, stir it and see what happens. So what if I did the cad yellow first and the ultramarine second, I would have gotten a probably a slightly different green. Just remember that. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but this is, this is what this is all about. So let's move on. And each of these that I'm showing you right now are either in this family to this family or this family to this family. Okay. So now let's look at the Payne's gray and the yellow ochre. So I get kind of a, a muted neutral color. Neutral meaning that it really isn't a color as much as it is a tint. But this could be good if I'm trying to make something that that tint would be useful in. So I need to know that. So making my swatch, I have that combination to work with. Now let's go to what you might call the violets and or purples, which are gonna be very, very hard to see, but stay with me. You got a lizard and crimson and you have cerulean blue. They give you this kind of a clean violet. And again, the values would vary depending on the amounts, reddish, more bluish. But then let's look at the cadmium red and the ultramarine blue, which are in the two boxes. It gives me kind of a dirty purple. But again, I can clean that up with the color mixture. It doesn't have to have that haze to it. I would be more concentrated on this particular part. And uh, these are cool and these are warm. So that's what happens when you mix those two together. Now, what happens if you mix all three? So that's when you get these kind of tints, which are all in the neutral family because they're headed towards a dark. So here's lemon yellow, alizarin crimson, cerulean blue together gives me a neutral kind of a warm dark. Cad yellow, cad red, ultramarine blue gives me a kind of a dark, but it's kind of on the bluish tint because the blue is so strong, it kind of overpowers the other two. Then when you go to the ochres, which are the, um, the more like earth tone colors with the Payne's gray, which is already a mixture of colors. So you get yellow ochre, burnt sienna and Payne's gray. You start getting a dark that's more on a neutral tint. I think they're all neutral tints, but it's just to what degree of the neutral tint do you want to achieve? And this could go on forever. You could literally play with so many different variables to get so many different greens and so many different violets and or purples and so many different oranges or so many different darks. But that's the importance of you playing with your colors. I would never tell you, you have to make your palette this way. I wouldn't say that. This is just comfortable for me. It's like my choice. So this is why I set my palettes up the way that I do. Again, these greens are here for a class purpose, but I like to make my own greens. I like to make my own oranges and I like to make my own purples. Am I opposed to those colors being in my palettes? Absolutely not. I have them. I own them. I just try to keep my palette limited. And these are the current choices that I have today. Rather than Daniel Smith and or Windsor Newton, which I do mix that up. So these are not all the same brand, but that's again, works for me. And um, I do this so that when I'm in a hurry and I'm just trying to match stuff, I know not to take here to, to, to here, for example, unless I just want something 
kind of on the dirty side. So I try to keep the warms with the warms, the cool with the cools. I very rarely mix the warms and the cools, but mixing warms and the cools doesn't negate the possibility of, of having additional colors to your spectrum. So I won't say I never use them because sometimes they are very, very useful. Sometimes Payne's Gray can be neutral, which I've heard some people say they don't particularly care for Payne's Gray. That's great too. Some people don't like Chinese white. Some people don't like um, any of the blacks. And I say use what you need to use to be creative as you're being creative. Unless you are some kind of master artist, watercolorist, and you've come to some level in your life where you can perform at an optimum level to get what you want and not bring in any of the colors that they say you shouldn't use, then I say go for it. But when I'm working, I don't have they in my ear and I don't have they on my palate and I try to get my job done as clean and as smooth and as comfortable as possible. So this is why I set my palette up this way. And I hope that in bringing up some of that warm and cool and tints of, of uh, blue or tints of, of green or, or, or those neutralized colors sparks an interest in you to want to learn more about that. I'm not going to really teach that. I'm just mentioning them because they are real and this is what occurs. You then has, have to pick up the ball and learn more about it because there's a rainbow of pre-made colors out there. But the question that I have is, what happens when you mix them together? How do you achieve the level of color spectrum in your artwork that you're looking for when you have a 32 well palette or a 64 color palette? That's a lot of colors to kind of swatch out and play combinations with, or maybe you don't swatch out. Maybe you don't play with colors. Maybe you just gamble. Maybe you just take a chance. And maybe, just maybe, that's why sometimes when you're painting, without you realizing it, you're creating this muddy color and you're wondering, but I thought if I mixed this and that, I would get this, but it depends on what's in this or that. And that's the truth. There's, that's not me. That's just, that's just watercolor or color science, because this is true of oils. This is true of pastels. This is true of watercolors. This is true of acrylics. Companies put a lot of different colors in their color combinations. You need to know what's the reaction. Like you have to become somewhat of a watercolor scientist. <laughs> so you have to kind of play and experiment so that you know what your palette is capable of. I did all of this with just these colors. And if I wanted to, I could take this to an even further level as I was saying before, to play with the different amounts of cadmium red to cad yellow, the different amounts of cad yellow to cadmium red and so forth and so on. And I could be making color swatches just on these two colors all afternoon. So I'm going to close on that note and just say I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share with you all of the things that I try to share, I try never to tell you that you have to do something. I just make suggestions such as play with your colors, experiment, play with the different brands that you have, see what they're capable of, see what happens when you marry them together, either in three or in fours. I could, I could take this experiment to four or five color combinations. For example, these two neutral tints together, as I showed you, will override each other. But what happens if you mix these two with yellow or these two with red or these two with blue? And which blue, which yellow, which red? See, it could go on and on and on and on and on. There's actually a book that's out there that could teach you about watercolors and how to mix them. Hold on, Let's see if I can grab it off my shelf. This is like a Bible for me. I've had this book probably for 20 years. It's called The Watercolor Mixing Directory. And I'm just going to flip through and show you that this book, it did exactly what I was saying. This book has taken colors upon colors and just mixed them and layered them just to see what happens. I couldn't do this. And if I did this, I am going to write me a book. So anyway, I'm going to close on that note because I'm getting kind of long winded. 
I just want to say that this is exciting for me. I, I, I love this. This is what keeps me going. When I, when I can't come up with an idea, which is very rare or something to paint or something to draw, I like doing this. I love experimenting with my colors. I love seeing, well, what, which ways can I experiment next? Like, what can I do next that might help me down the road? So when I'm painting, my life can be just a little bit easier when it comes to this broad world of color mixing. So on that note, I'm going to close and thank you. And if you have any questions, please let me know. You know, and if you have any um, suggestions or you think I might have said something that was incorrect, I'm not that thin skinned. Correct me. But I'm talking from doing. I'm, I'm not talking from being taught this. I'm talking from me just taking it upon myself to make my palette this way, to try my colors this way. And everybody talks about this, but I didn't watch something to show me to do this. This is just a natural thing that I do. I do it with my graphite pencils. I do it with my pastels. I do it with anything that comes into my studio that I'm going to call something I'm going to work with. I'm going to play with it and see how much further I can play with it until I can bend it break it and then remake it, you know? So at any rate, um, on that note, take care. Bye-bye.